Imagine this scenario. Someone comes up to you on the street two or three months from now. It's a, a warm spring day. And they begin to ask you and they say, hey, can you take five minutes of your time? Tell me about your beliefs. And you say, well, sure. And they say, do you believe in God? And you say, yes, I do. And they say, well, why? And you proceed to tell them how it is you're a Christian and how you believe in God. And they have some very logical answers that suggest that you are all wrong. And at the end of the conversation, you say to yourself, I don't think that person was very convinced at all. And I don't know if I made a very good defense of why I believe, why I believe I'm saved, why I believe that Christianity is true. Question. Is it possible, is it possible that you might walk away from that interview maybe a little bit shaken about your beliefs? Now, you may, you may say no, There are people doing this very thing, very carefully educated people who would fall into the atheist category today. And it seems like it might be good for us to revisit how do we know that Christianity is true. So we're going to think about this scenario today. But first of all, we want to win souls. We want to introduce them to Jesus Christ, Jesus, God come in human flesh, who took the just punishment for their sins and offers to forgive and transform them. We want to help them understand and accept God's gracious offer to them. We call it salvation. It comes from, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it comes from a 13th century word, a uh, late Latin word called salvatio. And it gives you these different definitions, but the first one is the one I agree with the most. Deliverance from the power and effects of sin. Salvation. Deliverance from the power and effects of sin. That's a very important and a very specific meaning. It's not just a general pardon, merely releasing one from a legal penalty. It is salvation deliverance from the power and effects of sin. So keep this in mind as we proceed. This thing, who you are, much more than what you say, is the determinative, fa the determinative factor in the influence you will have in drawing others toward Christ for salvation, deliverance from sin and the effects of sin. Loving God is to be the preoccupation of our lives. I'd like you to open over to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So we're going to just put this thing in front before we get to our main thing today. Deuteronomy 6. Who you are. That's a lot more to do than all of our argumentation. Loving God is to be the preoccupation of our lives. Everything else is going to flow from that. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9. It's not the New Testament, but boy, is it New Testament. Listen, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. All the day, let's see, I'm in uh, Numbers 6. Let's follow my own suggestion here. And here we go. Hear, O, Lord, o Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, you shall bind them. As a sign on your hand, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And 
loving the Lord with all of your heart, all your strength, all your soul. The preoccupation of our life. This is the core thing for winning other hearts. That, not our most persuasive arguments, not our most clever use of reason, not our feelings or our desires, but loving God is the center of our lives and radiating out from that and loving all others that are made in his image, that is the secret sauce that makes men and women effective soul winners. That's it right there. With that settled in our hearts, now I want us to look at how we, how we know Christianity is true. And I want to make a clear difference between your knowing that Christianity is true and your showing that Christianity is true. Because we're going to talk a little bit in different ways. If we're showing somebody that it's true, whereas the question this morning is more particularly, how do I personally, how do I know that Christianity is true? How do I know that I am in him and he is in me. How do I know that I have the witness of his Holy Spirit? And so today we're going to look at it this, this question more particularly. How do we know we're connected with Jesus? And you might find the answer a little bit different than you expected. Well, let's go over to Galatians chapter 3 and start there, Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 26 and then 4, verse 6. When one accepts God, one is adopted by him. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God, how? You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And then over in chapter 4, verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Now, I don't know if you think of yourself normally this way. Do you think of yourself as a sanctuary today? Here we are, a sanctuary full of orphans. You might not think of yourself that way. A sanctuary full of orphans who were adopted by God. So there's a new connection here. There's a connection because one has consciously accepted Jesus by faith. This creates you a son in him, a daughter in him. And since you are his child now, God sends his spirit into your heart. Now, you might say, well, boy, that sounds kind of subjective. It sounds like it's about feelings. I will admit it. It does sound subjective. The reason why it sounds subjective is because it is subjective. It is. See what it says? That the believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and one can have the witness that one is standing in a connected faith relationship with God by this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. You can know that you're connected to him and he's connected to you. We accept that even as we cannot see air but you need to breathe there to live. And we accept that even as we cannot see the Holy Spirit, he is set forth into our hearts to testify to us the reality of this connection with God. This is a part of the salvation experience, and it's one that sometimes maybe we Adventists might, might overlook. See, as a people, we're very interested in the teachings of Scripture. And well, we should be. If there's a lot more need for doctrine in Christianity today than there's ever been because it's being neglected in most places. There's not a lot of doctrinal teaching. So we should have an interest in that. But is it possible that we would emphasize the rational, 
uh, part to the, sometimes to the, uh, and leave out the subjective part. I think it is possible. Possible to have more of a head knowledge than a heart knowledge. And I would say to you that what God wants for you and for me is that you and I would both have a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. And in fact, without the heart knowledge, your head knowledge could be dangerous. Right? Right? I'm trying to tell you the truth. So, we need both parts. Our scripture reading today says it again over in Romans chapter 8. Let's look at that. Romans 8, verse 15 and 16. Paul speaks about this connection and of our adoption, not just in Galatians, but over here at Romans. Listen. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So if you're a Christian, I'm told right here, if you are a Christian, you are led by the Spirit of God. You are adopted, adopted into the renewed human family. The Holy Spirit bears witness with us that we are children of God. We know that we know him. We know that there is a God and that we have an experience of his Holy Spirit. He witnesses to us that we are children of God. Now this inner witness is mentioned many, many times and places in the Bible. Let's look at yet another one. Over here in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Verse 20 and then we'll look at 27 as well. Here's what 1 John 2 verse 20 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy, Holy One, and you know all things. Who has this anointing? You, the believer. Me, the believer. You have, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. Verse 27, The anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. The source of this anointing is God, and it's given to the individual Christian. It gives an awareness. Well, an awareness, an awareness of what? A sense of knowing that one is connected with God. This anointing, here's what it said, it teaches you concerning all things. Well, what things? Now, in the immediate context over here in John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, John is warning about Antichrist and teachings that deny the deity of Jesus. There were people who wanted to say, no, Jesus is not God. These Antichrists previously had claimed to be Christians, but according to verse 19, they had gone out from them. They, they'd separated from the church. They weren't real Christians. They left because they, didn't, they refused to believe in Jesus as God. The truth of which John speaks here is not only the sense that one is connected with God, but it's also the truth of the fact that Jesus and the Father both are God. This is, this is important teaching. Those who contradicted this teaching were seen to be contradicting the work of God. It did take a while for the church to come to more clarity about this teaching and some other teachings. But those who denied the deity of Jesus and the reality of his incarnation is coming in our human flesh those were viewed as bringing destructive and erroneous teachings. And so the, you see in the early church, they were very, there was a very firm line against this heretical teaching that Jesus wasn't God. So you see, these early Christians faced challenges. They were a relatively small group standing outside of the approved society. They didn't necessarily uh, have printing presses and scholars and have worked out all the intricacies so they could give the best explanation for what they believed. Sometimes they were exiled. At one point they were removed from Rome. Christians were thrown out of Rome. 
But I'm glad none of that will ever happen again. That was just in the past. I wonder if we could imagine a time, a time when because you make a Christian profession, you're not allowed to travel. A time when you said something, you put up on the internet that you believed in Jesus Christ, and they took your post off, because we don't talk about that anymore. I wonder if you can think of a time when you're not allowed to travel to the next city or the next country or the next state because maybe because you believe things that uh, you're not wanted to talk about. Oh, but pastor, this is America. We have freedom of religion. If you look around at what is presently happening, those days might not be so far away. I mean, not being the alarmist pastor, but I just want you to know, we're losing our freedoms by not, not by the month or day, we're losing them almost by the hour. Friends, it's important that we it's important that we know what we believe. It's important that we are willing to stand up for what we believe too. Because once you give away your rights and privileges, how many times does the government come by your house and say, hey, we've got a big list of freedoms that, uh, that you've given away. We're here to give them back. So the source of this anointing is God. It's given to the individual Christian. Antichrist went out. And these early Christians faced challenges, and it was a good thing that they had the inner witness of the Holy Spirit when they were challenged. Today, there's a group of people in uh, China. I, I think they're called Uyghurs. They're not Christians. They're uh, Muslim belief. But the best information I think that we have is that there are over a million of them in camps, re-education camps. And uh, that's not my topic today, but there are just strange times and bad things happening right now. And we should not feel that we're going to just glide through it on the magic carpet. It's going to be easy. There are times that try men's souls. And when those times are there, especially, we need a personal knowledge that God is with us. I want you to consider this statement from a book you, I hope you have on your shelf. It's called The Desire of Ages. This is from page 455 and then 456. Listen closely. I don't have it on a slide for you today, but listen closely. Truth must be received into the soul. It claims the homage of the will. If truth could be submitted to the reason alone, pride would be no hindrance in the way of its reception. But it is to be received through the work of grace in the heart, and its reception depends upon the renunciation of every sin that the Spirit of God reveals. And then on 456, to those who thus yield themselves to God, having an honest desire to know and to do his will, the truth is revealed as the power of God for their salvation. Now this, unquote. Now the inner witness is not accomplished via our reason apart from these other elements of the human faculty. I hope you notice that. The engagement of the will is essential. This work of grace is a supernatural influence. What is the source of it? It is external to you and me. It comes from outside. And then when it comes to us, it comes to where? It comes to our heart. And it's not submitted to the reason alone. In fact, your reason might be misused rather easily. It has to go to the will as well. 
This work of grace is a supernatural influence. It is external to the believer. It acts upon the believer. We can be thankful that God acts upon us. But this action is connected to the free will choice of the receiving agent. You're the receiving agent. I'm the receiving agent. You know what? We choose to accept or reject the influence. You better believe it. In the time of the Gospels, when Jesus was preaching and teaching, there were people in the crowd, and some of them were accepting the influence. And some of them were standing there rejecting the influence. Imagine that. Jesus is 20 feet from you preaching, telling the truth of God, and meanwhile in your heart you're rejecting that. But there were people that did that. This quotation, the desire to know and to do his will has to be, and it can be, honest. This is not a call to perfection. You don't have to have a perfectly submitted will to God, a perfect, perfect desire to follow him. If you wait for that, you might be waiting too long. When do you get that? We need to accept him now. It's not a requirement for perfection, but it is simply the requirement that the interest has to be actual. There has to be a desire in you, a desire owned by the individual, a desire that arises freely within you as the individual. To that person, to that person, she said this, the truth is revealed as the power of God for salvation. That's what I want. The truth is revealed revealed as the power of God for salvation. That's sort of a general thing too, isn't it? We should not think that the truth that the Holy Spirit teaches us in this sense includes all the subtleties of Christian doctrine. Rather, what I'm talking about this morning is the inner assurance that the Holy Spirit gives us that these of these truths that are very basic to the Christian faith. Okay? We can know from the inner witness that God is at work in us to save us. The Holy Spirit also works in us as we acquire a much more specific uh, doctrinal knowledge as we study the Bible. And we will come to a, a very clear understanding, more rational component of what the Bible teaches, you know, seeing how the pieces fit together and it makes sense, it's logical, okay? The Holy Spirit helps us with that too. What I'm talking about this morning, though, is not that. I'm not saying that um, somebody, um, let's see, what? Let's say a Lutheran or a, a, a Catholic person walks in off the street, walks up to me and says, and we start talking, and I say, by the way, I'm glad you're a Christian because you'll have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, and I expect them to say, oh, that's truth. No, the, 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 we need to study it with them in the Bible. I don't expect that I will declare it, and they'll say, oh, yeah, that's right. I'm just getting a... I'm getting a message from heaven right now that that's true. We, we need to study. The Holy Spirit will help us. But I'm talking this morning about how I know that, that God and I are connected. In a more, it's a more general thing. Although we can use arguments and evidence to support our faith as believers, and we're going to talk, you know, right now we're talking about knowing that Christianity is true. We're going to talk some more about showing that Christianity is true. In fact, I'll tell you right now what I'm working on. I call it ICE, the Initiative for Conversational Evangelism. ICE, I-C-E. I-C, yeah, it's I-C. But you know what? We don't know. We don't know how long our churches will be open. We don't know when we'll get to do an evangelistic meeting on the Internet again. We, we really, the way things are going, we don't know very much. We don't know when they'll close us down or... or, or, or Take us away. And so, and one of the first ones that's going to be taken away is probably me. You know, they'll, why not? They'll take the pastors and the elders. Of course. So listen, we need to all know how we can converse and share our faith, and we're going to find ways to help us know how more easily and more effectively to do that. So I'm working on ICE, so I hope you have an interest in that. And this talk today is kind of the first piece of kind of getting us in this direction. So, yeah, the cat's out of the bag, no secrets here. That's where I'm try hoping to go. So we can use arguments and evidence, and we're going to use them more as we talk about showing that Christianity is true, showing what present truth is. And this year we're going to talk a lot more about specifics of Seventh-day Adventist present truth, too. We haven't talked as much about that, but we're going to do more. 
starting in two weeks. But I want you to know that today we're dealing with knowing that, that we're connected with Jesus. So now, we know that God is God. We know that Christianity is real because of the self-authenticating witness of God's spirit who lives in us. But Steps to Christ, page 111, says something quite interesting. Steps to Christ, page 111. Listen to this. There is an evidence open to all. And then she lists, you know, the educated, the worker, all different kinds of people. So just to get to the end of the sentence, she says, there is an evidence open to all. Then she lists them. The evidence of experience. Now, how many people was this evidence open for? It is an evidence open to all. So is Ellen White here, is she lowering the place of experience here, or is she lifting it up? She's not taking away from Bible study. Ellen White would never do that. But she's telling us experience has a proper place. And in fact, if we neglect it, we get into some trouble. When I was in Kenya a couple of years ago and had the privilege to preach there, I found out what the biggest Christian church in Kenya is. The KS, I think it's KSGO, I can't remember now. Anyway, what it works out to, it's the Kenyan Assemblies of God. That's a Christian church. Now, we don't believe everything the same way as the Assembly of God does. We're trying to follow the Bible as closely as we can. You know, one of, the hot, one of the key points for assembly of God is this idea of experience. We maybe have not given it as much space as we should have. So we're not, we're not going to go out and speak in crazy tongues, but we, we, need to know, we need to have an experience with Jesus. So uh, she's lifting up, I think, the value of experience. She's reminding us how important this is. I want you to understand that we are not we're not here somehow flying by the seat of our pants outside the Bible. This is a very Bible thing. We've used a lot of Bible so far to talk about this witness of the Spirit, haven't we? Now we're going to say some more. In fact, let's uh, look at another one. Go over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 24. The Bible says more about the inner witness. Here's what the scriptures say here. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us. By what? By the spirit whom he has given us. So we know that he abides in us by the Holy Spirit. He has given us his Holy Spirit. This presence is connected here to our being what? Obedient, obedient to the commandments. Yes, commandments that God has revealed. So if a person is playing loosely with God's revealed will, he cannot receive this, this reassurance from God very well, can he? Because he knows he's disobedient. Yeah. But if he's submitting to what God has revealed to him, then here's the promise of his witnessing presence. The Holy Spirit can be with us and help us know that we are connected to him. Go over one page to 1 John 4, verse 13. 1 John 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. By what? Well, it's not done. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Yes, there it is. See, God has something for us, something we can know. We can know that we're living in connection with him. There will be those who attempt to dispute with us the existence of God or the authenticity of your supernatural connection with him. There are people out there doing it. If there's no God, then of course, you know, you can't be experiencing any supernatural connection with him. So you can see why their logic, how their logic works. And there's going to be occasions, though, when we must remember this statement, Desire of Ages 495. It's a one-liner. I don't think, actually, I don't like this one. I'll tell you right now, I don't like this statement. But here's what it says. The science of salvation cannot be explained. 
I'm a pastor. I go to school to learn how to explain it. I don't like this sentence. I'm a Christian. I want to explain it to people. Well, I didn't finish the sentence, but I don't, still don't like the sentence. But here's, here's the whole thing. The science of salvation cannot be explained, but it can be known by experience. And I like the last part. You can't explain it in full. Yes, you can explain it in part, of course. But you can't explain it out to the full heights and depths. But you know what? You can know it by experience. And somebody says, oh, that's a cop-out. That's a cop-out. What about the, the other person, the, the Hindu? What about the Mormon? What about the person who says, well, I have an experience with God, and, and I, I could tell by the burning in my bosom, you know. Well, what did we read back in the Bible here at 1 John? Keeping the commandments is a piece of being able to have this reassurance. So, no, not just every person that randomly thinks, uh, claims to be having an experience with God. I, I don't accept every, every random thing. Oh, that's definitely from God. Well, no, not necessarily. The Bible's the test. But we can, but here's the sentence again. The science of salvation cannot be explained, but it can be known by experience. And I'm going to use this. It can be known by experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on that somewhat. That's an important part of the total Christian understanding. It's right to try to sort out and better understand our beliefs, our experience, how the elements of faith, repentance, God's promises, conscience, how all that works together. Yes, we should try to understand it. And we can understand it to some point. And we should do what we can to understand it. At the same time, there are things that are beyond explanation, things that are beyond the strictly rational. Is this, does this surprise anybody? I mean, we're talking about the infinite God. He's been around a while. You know, I, I've been around a few decades. You've been around a few decades. God's been around from eternity. That's, that's, I think that's a long time. So it shouldn't be a surprise that there are things about him that we can't understand so far. Maybe things we will never understand, right? Because we're never going to be infinite, are we? So get used to it. There are things that, that are bigger than your brain. Okay. It shouldn't surprise us. We are limited beings. God is an infinite being. In his word, he asks us to pursue an experiential relationship with him. For example, Psalm 34, verse 8. Listen to this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So tasting and trusting are very important. The question is not rationality or subjectivity, but it is rationality and subjectivity. Not the head or the heart, but the head and the heart. So that makes sense. So we've looked at the book of Romans before. I want to turn our attention here as we're carrying on. I want to look at the um, Romans chapter 1, and I hope you'll turn there. I want to look at part of this, especially with relation to the unbeliever. But it points out something important for the believer as well. We're going to look especially at Romans 1, verse 18 to 21. This is a really important passage when we think about uh, our initial scenario, right? Right? So when he walks up to you on the street, they talk to you about their beliefs or about your beliefs, and pretty soon they're spouting a bunch of things that sound pretty, pretty rational, but no. Here's what the Bible tells us, Romans 1, starting at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because... What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Notice it doesn't say unclearly seen. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, ouch, they are without excuse, because... Although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
So now there are many people in many ways who are engaged today, presently, in, in suppressing the truth of God. Some of them are outside the church. Some are in the church. You say, well, how can that be? I'm sorry, it, 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 there's a truth to it. Some are suppressing the truth because they are committed rebels, right? Some are just out there. Don't mind, they don't mind saying so. But I think a lot of people suppress the truth. Frankly, I think a lot of people suppress the truth because they are confused. They're confused about what's right, and they're still sorting things out. So let's not be too quick to be sure we know that you know who is who. Because it turns out that a lot of people are figuring out what is what. And they just haven't figured it out yet. And God is long-suffering and patient. And he wants us in the kingdom. He's not trying to sort people out. He's trying to sort us in. So don't be too quick to think you know who's who. Who's left the faith. Who's practicing evil and has lost their way completely. You know, God is very patient. If that weren't true, this room would be empty. Because you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. So now here's our main point of interest. We turn to this passage. What may be known of God is manifest in them. God is working for them in the midst of the people, even in providential interventions and incidents in their lives. And God isn't keeping his interventions secret. Before I became a Christian, there were some providential interventions in my life. One morning, I was driving to work. It was still dark. I had a Dodge vehicle with a 318 cubic inch V8 engine. Which I didn't use correctly. And I was moving it in a very high rate of speed. Suddenly, and I mean, uh, yeah, it was way too fast. Suddenly, I see in front of me hardly the distance, I think, between here and the front door of the church. A big white van is parked in my lane, exactly in the underpass. And I knew in that moment I was going to die. I'm going to hit that thing square on. And if you look up the, the distance, you know, like how quick humans can react, get certain how far your headlights show and how far you can see. And that, that was going to be my funeral. But as it turned out, I don't know what happened, but I spun the wheel, or the angel spun the wheel, and the car went around a couple of times. By the way, this is right under an underpass like this, and the van's right here, and there's only, like, only one way. Like, if you were an experienced stunt driver, I'm not sure you could get that every time. But anyway, whoop, whoop, I'm through it, and didn't smash my car at all. And as I sat there on the side of the road. I wasn't a Christian, but I was absolutely sure that God, whoever he is, that God had intervened and given me additional opportunity to live and come toward him. So God isn't keeping his miraculous interventions secret. And I didn't become a Christian right away. But boy, I want you to know, my perspective got to change right there. So God is working. He shows people that he's intervening for them. He wants them to know it. He's working for hearts every day and every hour through the long years of every life. 
Say, oh, well, God forgot me. No, he didn't. God has not forgotten you. He hasn't forgotten your loved ones. He is on the job. He's working for hearts. No one is without excuse, Romans tells us. But this is not God making sure everyone can be condemned. It is God doing all that he can while he, ex while he respects the exercise of the free will he has given to us so that we will be drawn to him and turn to him. It's about his working to save humans. So we wanted to consider what this passage means in terms of internal witness. Now, this is, we're talking more generally, right? This, what this passage is about is really what we call God's general witness, right? Here I, an unbeliever, I was an unbeliever, and yet God intervened for me. Didn't earn it, you know, just like, here's a freebie for you. And as an unbeliever, God did something for me. And God, this passage is telling us that God shows every person, believer and unbeliever, he's working for you. This is what we call God's general witness. Look over across the page to, uh, to Romans 2, verse 4. We're not leaving this passage yet, but Romans 2, verse 4. The goodness of God leads us to repentance. And God was working to lead me to repentance that morning. And I didn't drive as fast after that either. So God is working for every human. This isn't quite the same as the internal witness we've been talking about, but the witness of the Holy Spirit to the believer that he's a child of God. That's what we're really talking mostly about. But that witness is internal. That's limited to the believer. The witness here in Romans chapter 1 is the more general witness that, you know what, there is a God. There is a God. What, do you, what you do about him is up to you. But he refuses to leave humans in darkness. I love this about him. He shows every human being that he exists. Romans 1.28 warns us that some people do not want to retain God in their knowledge. And you know what? God doesn't force these people. He, he, he lets them go. Now add to this entire situation this statement. This is from Steps to Christ again. This is page 28. It's not a long one, but listen. Steps to Christ, page 28. The same divine mind that is working upon the things of nature is speaking, I love it, it's present tense, is speaking to the hearts of men and creating an inexpressible craving for something they have not. The things of the world cannot satisfy their longing. The Spirit of God is pleading with them to seek for those things that alone can give peace and rest, the grace of Christ and the joy of holiness. Now, so we see that God is at work to win us. He knows what we need, and he wants us to know we need it, but he chooses not to manipulate us. Now, pay attention to this. He puts the truth within our reach, and he calls us, but he does not exercise our will for us. He even helps us desire it, but he does not require us to choose it. You say, well, that sounds a little bit like manipulation. Oh, but is it? But is it? Think about it. He doesn't eliminate the competing desires, right? Sources of evil and self-serving. We've developed habits, practices of sin in our life, and he doesn't throw, he doesn't block those. He doesn't anesthetize or numb us from that. We still, people still have those. But what God does is he adds to that. He gives you a desire for truth. He gives you a desire for holiness and what's right. He just, he's adding that to the mix. The mix is I desire these evil things. And God says, well, think about this too. And he gives us a craving. He gives us a desire for the, for the right. But he lets us choose. Is that manipulative? I think it's fair. He's just saying, hey, there's an option out here. Taste and see that the Lord is good. See? So no, he's not manipulating us. He's just giving an opportunity for us to desire the truth. He's a good God. 
This is one more indicator of his love for us, that he refuses to force us. And I wanted to look at it here in Romans 1, even though we're talking more about the general witness there. But I wanted you to look at it to remember, to it might encourage you to remember this general witness of God's existence, to God's existence and reality, that God is working for every single human heart. And your loved ones that haven't come to the, to the faith, or are having problems or drifting from the faith. God is working for them. God is on your side. He's working for them. He, he's working for your loved ones. Even so, your salvation experience brings a much more specific witness, a witness to you as a believer that God loves you, he accepts you, he embraces you, he is working for you to transform you, and that he's on your side. You are his adopted child. His kingdom is your kingdom. You're added to his family. You're no longer an orphan. You belong to Jesus. Welcome to the house of orphans. Now, we're almost done, but I want to look at two more very quickly, just shortly, briefly, two more uh, brief statements. I want you to consider these. This is Desire of Ages, page 347. I'll read it to you. Listen closely because I didn't have it on the slide. Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge his grace as made known through the holy men of old. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace when supported by a Christ-like life have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. Wow. Wow, that's... You have a unique experience. This is by divine design. He wants us to learn how to have an experience and to share our experience with others. Is his power working in us? Then it says we will reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Wouldn't it be something if you were talking to somebody in the store and they were just blessed because you led them uh, to think spiritually and, and they got some fresh thoughts, and the Holy Spirit was working with them, wouldn't it be awesome if they, if they said to you, what's going on? I think there's a power working in you that's divine. I wouldn't be able to sleep after a meeting like that. I'd go home and say, honey, let me tell you this. So anyway, and one more statement. Desire of Ages, page 493, just uh, two sentences. Nothing reaches so fully down to the deepest motives of conduct as a sense of the pardoning love of Christ. We are to come in touch with God. Then we shall be imbued with his Holy Spirit that enables us to come in touch with our fellow man. Yes. So I want to encourage you today to become more sensitive to the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. This is going to help us to better know how we can share the blessings God gives us with other people. Well, in conclusion then, if someone comes to you on the sidewalk a few months from now on a warm spring day, and you find yourself engaged in a, in a conversation about how you know that you're connected to God. I hope that some of the scriptures we've looked at this morning, some of the things we've talked about, will help you to know. It's not about whether you can give the, uh, the Kalam argument or the ontological argument or the teleological argument for God's existence. I mean, those things aren't bad. They're not, you know... But it's not about how clever you are or how many 
quotations from scholars you can give or how persuasive your reasoning is. What matters is that you have an experience with Jesus, that you're living an experience with his present truth, and that you know you're connected with him. Even if they scoff at you and laugh at you or throw you down and, and kill you right there on the side of the street. What matters is that you know Jesus. And so don't be discouraged if you feel like, man, I, that was the most terrible explanation I've ever given. God will use it. God will, God will edit it for you, okay? <laughs> and I'm sure God edits our explanations many times so that other hearts will get it better than we gave it. But you know what? Let's trust in the Lord. We should be able to know where we are in our relationship with God and have a sense of his real affection for us. Sometimes we doubt if God even loves us. It's all wrong. He loves us. He loves us in a way that cannot be put into, a, into human language. He protects us, and he appreciates that we've made a decision. Our chosen destiny, destiny is to receive him, eternal life from him, and transformation so that we're ready for his soon appearing. God, The God we serve is a good God. He died on the cross for us to give us eternal life. His Holy Spirit will witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. Welcome to the house of orphans. And let's, let's know that Christianity is true. And God will open my mouth, Lord, and, and the Lord will fill it. And God, God is on our side. He's so glad that you've decided to be his child.